as we move into chapter 9 and continue, we're going to be talking about graphing again, but now we have a new function we're going to introduce to you. And this is called the inverse function or an inverse variation. And this inverse variation um, is in generally the form y equals k over x. And that's uncommon to what we've done before, but we're going to experiment and look at what this graph looks like today. Um, there is one stipulation on this graph, and that one simple stipulation is the fact that k cannot be zero. You can't have a numerator of zero when you're looking at the sample parent graph. So this will be a new parent graph of y equals kx. And that is our parent graph as we're always looking at our different parent graphs like log, parabolas, you know, absolute values and things like that. So as we begin, we have the equation y equals k over x. Now, I think it's fairly obvious the fact that you have a denominator of the value x. And so my question is, what value can that denominator not be? And I hope that's very straightforward and simple. Very simply that that denominator cannot be equal to zero. Okay, so we're going to put x cannot be equal to zero. And as a result, if we think about this as a graph, I'm going to draw a graph here. When we have x equaling zero, what that's going to give us is a line, and I'm going to make this a dotted line, as the value, and so that asymptote is something that the line is going to approach but not equal. So our asymptote is going to be x cannot be equal to zero, or x equals zero is the asymptote. But either way, we want to draw that dotted line there. Now, in comparison, we also want to look at the value of k. And since k cannot be zero, and if x can't be zero, my question is, can you get an answer of zero? Can you have anything over another number and get the value of zero? And so hopefully you're realizing the answer to that is no. You cannot do that. You cannot get y equal to zero. And so that's impossible. And so as a result, I'm going to draw another small little graph. And I'm going to put, what does it look like when y equals zero? Well, that's this horizontal line here. And so that is another asymptote of y equals zero. So a parent graph has two asymptotes. One is x equals zero and one is y equals zero. So we want to be realizing that we're going to end up having two asymptotes on this function. Let's take a look at how we graph this. It's a unique graph and it comes in two parts or branches where all of our other graphs in the past have had only one part. But the, the word branches, I'm going to underline in green, just helping you remember it's got two parts to the tree or two parts of our branches. These branches do not connect. They don't touch each other. And they each are going to be separated by these horizontal and vertical asymptotes. So to do this first, I think to start off, the easiest way to do this is to make a table. We're going to choose two points to the right of zero, two points to the left of zero to give you a feel of what this looks like. So here I have my first function, y equals 8 over x. So I'm going to just choose values that easily divide into 8. So I'm going to choose x equals 1. 8 divided by 1 is 8. And I'm going to plot that point 1 comma 8. Now I'm going to choose another point that goes easily into 8. That would be 2. 8 divided by 2 is 4. So the point 2 comma 4. And then I'm going to choose another point 4 goes easily into 8, so 4 comma 2, so 4 comma 2. And then my fourth point that I'm going to choose is the value 8, 8 comma 1. So this is a very accurate graph that we have here. And so I'm going to sketch this graph. But what I think you realize is I haven't chosen any points that are negative values. So let's say, can we also have negative values? Well, I think you realize you can, and so I'm just going to go through and change this value of x to a negative, which changes that to a negative. So negative 1, negative 8. If you plug in negative 2 for x, that's going to give you negative 4 for y. If you plug in negative 4 for x, that's going to give you a negative 2 for y. So 4, negative 2. And finally, if you plug in negative 8 for x, that's going to give you a negative 1 for y. And so here we have the graph on the negative side coming through on each part. And maybe by now you start to see and realize that this blue and this red line 
are symmetrical to each other and they're symmetrical flipped over the origin and the line y equals negative x, which is the line coming down straight through here. I'll see if I can draw our line of symmetry as those points are going to be flipping through there just perfectly. And so that that's a dotted line here. And that's the line of symmetry around which this graph is based. Okay, so we're going to get rid of that line just because we don't need it. All right, so now as we're going down from here, what we're going to try to look at is say, okay, what are the equations of these asymptotes? So I'm going to draw on my asymptotes. We have a horizontal asymptote right here. And if you remember from above, that asymptote is y cannot be zero. And then we have a vertical asymptote at the y-axis. And the equation of that magenta vertical asymptote is x cannot be zero. So that's the vertical asymptote. And the green one is the horizontal asymptote. So that's the basic look of what an inverse function is. We've uh, answered the question, yes, it is symmetrical over the line y equals negative x. Um, it's also symmetrical across the line y equals x. Um, all right, moving on. Here we're going to compare the difference between y over x and 4 over x. So let's plug in our values. I'm going to choose x equals 1, and that's the point 1. I'll do this first one in blue. I'm going to choose the point 2. That's 2 comma 1 half. Choose the point 3. Well, that's just going to get closer and closer there. I'm going to choose now the point negative 1. I guess before that, I should kind of graph this and realize it's going to be symmetrical since you now know the basic shape of a parent function. Negative 1 is going to give you negative 2. So negative 1, negative 2. And then we'll choose negative 2, and that's going to give us the point negative 1 half. So negative 2, negative 1 half. And so here we see we have our value of our blue function, which is 1 over x. Now let's go back and compare that to our first function of 8 over x. I hope you see, and maybe up here, that that graph is further away from the origin than this 1 over x graph. And so maybe you can make a prediction based on looking at those two of what 4 over x is going to be. Is it going to be tighter into the axes or further out? Hopefully you can realize that that's going to be further out, but let's plug in our points nonetheless. x equals 1, well 4 divided by 1 is 4, so 1 comma 4. x equals 2, y equals 2, and then you have 4 comma 1. So here you see our red graph is slightly further away from the origin than the blue graph is. We could plot some other points, say negative 1, negative 4, and negative 4, negative 1 and negative 2, negative 2. And so you can see on both of these graphs that our graphs are slightly further away. And so as we summarize this, I guess we would say the larger values of k are further from the origin as a general rule. And once again, we have in blue, we have 1 over x. In red, we have 4 over x. And then up here, we have 8 over x. So hopefully you can see all three of those as a comparison. Our asymptotes here, though, will be the same. We're still going to have an asymptote horizontally, as you notice, of y equals 0, and a vertical asymptote. of x equals 0. And which graph is closer to the x-axis and the y-axis? Well, I think you would say y equals 1 over x is the closer unit. All right.
Our next little example, we're going to talk about what happens when you multiply the graph by negative 1. So by now we're practicing our inverses, 2 over x. It's not going to be as tight as 1 over x, but it's still going to be fairly tight. I'm going to plug in x equals 1. That means y equals 2, so 1, 2. I'm going to plug in x equals 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1, so that's the point 2, 1. And so you can very quickly draw this sketch. Here we go. There's our first sketch. And hopefully by now you realize that's going to then take the inverse, so negative 1, negative 2, and negative 2, negative 1. So our blue graph represents that first one. Now, negative 2 over x. I'm going to change this to magenta as our other color as we graph this. If x equals 1, then y equals negative 2 x equals 1, y equals negative 2, negative 1, sorry, 1, negative 2. Now this is interesting, we just jumped into the fourth quadrant. If x equals 2, y equals negative 2 over 2, which is negative 1. So when we multiplied by a negative 1, it looks like it flipped our original graph up in the first quadrant down to the fourth quadrant, and that should be similar because you've multiplied the outside in front by a negative and that's a flip over the x-axis. Then let's plot our other points. Let's try negative 1. Let me change some colors here just so it's very clear. I'm going to box this in with two colors. Negative 1 over divided into negative 2 is positive 2. And then negative 2 gives you positive 1. So the green part is the flip over from the third quadrant, and the magenta part is the flip over from the first quadrant. So I'm just going to put some arrows here that remind us that this is flipping over the x-axis. Now, once again, we do still have our asymptotes. You'll notice your asymptotes have still stayed the same. There's the first asymptote at y equals, or y cannot be equal to zero. And our second asymptote, um, I'll put in red. That's our vertical asymptote once again. And our vertical asymptote is the equation x cannot be equal to zero. So the outcome of this, when you multiply the outside by a negative, it's going to flip to the second and fourth quadrant. A normal inverse variation graph will be in the first and the fourth quadrant. So that's kind of a summary of multiplying by negative one. Okay, let's come to our final idea today, which is very similar to chapter eight, and let's talk about shifts, translating them horizontally and vertically. If the adding or subtracting variable is inside the function as it is down here at the bottom, then that's going to be a horizontal shift. If the adding or subtracting function is outside the function, then that's going to be a vertical shift, as you can see here. And let's take a look at the impact of this. Our first one, we have x plus 2 inside the function. So that's going to be a horizontal shift to the left two units. The plus red is going to be a vertical shift up three units. So let's draw our asymptotes up three units. Let's draw my other asymptote in blue to the left two units. And that gives us our basic graph now in a shifted variety. Remember our original parent graph, I'm just going to sketch this in green, something like this. So our new answer, I'm going to put in magenta, just shifting these over. And so here we have them shifted very simply over. Okay. If we had to describe what the equations of our asymptotes would be, our horizontal asymptote equation is going to be x equals negative 2. Our vertical asymptote equation is going to be y equals 3. Let's look at example 5. 
we have a minus 1 on the inside of the function. So the horizontal shift is to the right 1. We have a minus 2 at the back of the function. So the vertical shift is down 2. So let's draw our asymptotes down 2. Let's draw our vertical asymptote to the right 1. Now, I didn't make this a negative on the original problem. Remember, the normal parent function is in the first and the third quadrant in green here. And so if it's negative, it's going to flip to the other two quadrants. But this is positive again. And so this is just going to be in the first and the third quadrants. But let's make our final answer in magenta, reflecting the fact that we have new asymptotes here. And there we go. Remember, you're approaching your asymptotes, but you're not crossing them. And had we had a different function, something like this, y equals the opposite of 1 over x minus 1 minus 2, then that would have been in the second and fourth quadrants. Okay, so just as a sidebar, that little idea there, the second and fourth quadrants could have happened in that case. Hope this has been clear as we talked about inverse variation and graphing of those. I've included your problems here. Um, the expectation is that you work these problems on your OneNote or on your drawboard. I've also given you tables and charts that you can snip in to hopefully help you be successful in this. All right. Well, that concludes our video for today. I hope this has been helpful.